following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, down by the lagoon at the 420 Studios. Archie Bunker would pronounce it that way. The lagoon. We have one in Alameda. And... Um, I'm hanging on the phone with one of my favorite human beings in the entire world, uh, Alan Blumpkin. How are you, my friend? Hanging in there. Good. It's rough, uh, rough in New York where you yes. are. Uh, yeah. We're talking a little off the air. Tell me about uh, uh, people on the freeways in New Jersey. Yeah, people on the, uh, the highways in New York and the you know suburbs of New Jersey. And this went all, this storm went uh, all the way up the it turned in, coming from the Midwest, but it came clashed with another one coming up the coast, the Atlantic coast, and it turned into uh, everybody's favorite type of storm here in northeast nor'easter. And it got very cold. Snow was falling uh, for several hours at two inches an hour, uh, and uh, it, it turned into rain and sleet here. And, uh, you know, the roads here became fairly decent this afternoon, but uh, there were cars that were stuck uh, basically because of accidents on, uh, on uh, you know, area scenes like the George Washington Bridge and the West Side Highway, anything that was approaching the George Washington Bridge, and it happened at the worst possible time when all the snow started, when all the schools got out and everything else started when the people were leaving for leaving work. So there were people that took, uh, especially in New Jersey, took eight, nine, ten hours after they left their place of employment to get home. Incredible. Yeah, cars, uh, they showed shots of the West Side Highway uh, where the cars were not moving. You know, I, I would... Um Except that, like in a place like Virginia, if they have these storms. But New York, New Jersey, they should be prepared a little bit more. Or, or yeah, that they, you know, the for, forecasters uh, uh, initially underestimated the amount of snow that would fall. And once it started falling, uh, you, know, you, you know, with all these, these drivers out there, you'd figure there was going to be a few uh, accidents. And the accidents, uh, you know, especially where they were happening, tied up, uh, tied up almost everything. And people, you know, were driving, not basically not being able to see out their uh, front window. Incredible. When you're going two miles an hour, it, that doesn't really matter that much. But if you're trying to go a little faster, there are people driving on sidewalks. Uh, it, it, it's just unbelievable, and of course the, uh, uh, you know, the Blasio here and his uh, transportation head were defending the city's response. Yeah, it's like Trump defending uh, yeah. response to Puerto Rico. Oh, we did great. Those, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> same kind, of, and that's really the trouble with society. People can't accept responsibility. For what they do and say uh, I was wrong or uh, no basically if you're in a bureaucracy you're heading a bureaucracy and I've faced this in all the years I worked for IBM and the, then the transit authority the, the, they created political uh, authorities here uh, basically it's a way to avoid responsibility yeah and the top officers in the transit authority a contractual. So if uh, things are going bad, they just don't renew the contract, and they run around. The, you know, they told the contract is going to be over in six months. They run around and give give uh, you know money to their favorite uh, consultants and all that. It's just uh, you know it is what it is. And as long as you, get, you have that, you have total division of responsibility. Nothing is really going to change. Hey, uh, Al, let's cheer ourselves up uh, okay. by going into our fantasy world of baseball and um, uh, looking back on some old memories. Maybe we can uh, 
put ourselves in better better moods. Um, I thought we'd talk about the old Milwaukee Braves and uh, their remarkable record of. I, I think they were only in Milwaukee. They came thirteen the seasons. They were thirteen seasons. Never. And they had a winning record in uh, all thirteen seasons. In contrast, the A's were in Kansas record. City 13 years, and they had losing records all every year. Okay. But uh, how they got from Boston to Milwaukee uh, is uh, interesting enough. Uh, uh, the Bra- Braves, uh, ever since the 1930s, were always second fiddle to the Red Sox. They were second fiddle to the Red Sox in the first uh, 20 years of, uh, of the 20th century, when the Red Sox had uh, were winning all the time, the Red Sox uh, in the twenties were courtesy of Harry Frazee for a fifteen year period became uh, fight. All they did was fight with uh, the uh, Connie Mac A's to be the worst team in the American League. And things started to change when Dewey, uh, bought, uh, Dewey excuse me, Yorkie bought the team in, in nineteen thirty three, and. Uh, the Red Sox uh, start to put together contenders. Of course, they were only you know, good enough to win one time in 1946, and the Braves became second fiddle again. And uh, the Braves won a National League pennant in 1948, a big upset over the Dodgers and the Cardinals. And uh, what happened in 1949 is the manager, Billy Southworth, who uh, had managed the Cardinals for three straight pennants in the from 42 to 44, and managed the Braves in 48. Uh, uh, he he got very depressed again. He he had a son that survived flying a whole bunch of missions in Europe, and then in 19, early 1945 uh, was in a training operation at LaGuardia, and his plane crashed and he was killed. Oh shit! And according to uh, biographies of Southworth, he, he has never to go really went through the whole war. Yeah, really recovered from that. Yeah. In Queens, so as things start, things start to get sour in 1949. Uh, he, uh, he, yeah, they, they kept up his manager, and uh, the players that really couldn't get along with him were uh, Alvin Dock and Eddie Stanky, who was was were the double play combination, and both of whom were fairly religious. Okay, and they couldn't stand Southwest drinking and cursing. And at the end of the season, they traded them to the Giants for uh, Sid Gordon, Willard Marshall, and Buddy Kerr. And that started the Braves' downward flow to the point where and in 19... The Giants upward... Yeah, the Giants went up and the Braves went down. Right. And uh, in 1952, they packed the, uh, the, the crowd, uh, crowd total in Boston for 77 home games of 281,000. Wow. Which is they pretty low. Out. Now, their yes. AAA farm team in the American Association was Milwaukee. And Milwaukee uh, voted to build a, 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 a big league ballpark uh, because the, where the minor league team, team played in, a stadium called Borchard Stadium was outmoded. So, uh, now, Bill Vack wanted to get the Browns out of St. Louis. He uh, tried to, uh, the American League wouldn't let him out. He tried for a while to, uh, you know, make the Browns the uh, prominent team in St. Louis over the Cardinals. That didn't work too well. No. So in the February 1953, when, uh, especially when the Cardinals were sold in early 1953 from an owner named Fred Sy, who, uh, was uh, convicted of tax evasion to the Bush family, who controlled Anheuser Bush beer. Vet uh, knew that uh, you know, he couldn't uh, drive them out, so he looked to move, and he wanted to move into Milwaukee, especially since they were building this beautiful new ballpark, which you know turned out to be County Stadium. And the American League refused to let him go. The owners. The other one was in the American League, hated his guts. I didn't realize that Beck wanted to go to Boston. Yeah, he, well, he had a, a successful AAA team uh, uh, there for uh, several years, and uh, 
We had Casey Stengel as a manager there. I didn't know that either. Yeah, that was his first oh. uh, venture into organized baseball was the uh, minor league Milwaukee Brewers. Whoa. Thank you for that. So, I, so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, they kept back to St. Vic, Louis. Did Vic sell the teams to Baltimore? Yeah. Yep. A, the only way they would, the American League would approve it is if he got out. Entirely. Yeah. Now, how'd they let him back in later on with the White Sox, with the Indians? He, he, he uh, that would... well, things have uh, relaxed uh, quite a bit afterwards. Uh, most of the old owners who opposed them were gone. They put together a syndicate, and the White Sox were a, a basket case at that point. Okay. So in, 19, in the early 1970s, so uh, uh, they allowed him in. Well, how'd they allow him in first with Cleveland, if they were so against him going? No, he, he had other partners. Oh, okay. He had partners, and so when the you know the when they took control of the Indians, he was the one who became essentially the uh, you know the uh, the the, the uh, big partner. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah. Would you so, say that if Jack, if um, Jackie Robinson didn't come in with Branch Rickey, that um, Vec would have brought Blacks into baseball? Very possible. He did bring Blacks if he brought in Larry Dolby uh, midway through 1947. But and then if he had done that on his own, was yeah, he prepared to do that? I think he was he pos possible. Okay. There's, there was again, a story yeah, going around that, you know, I don't know how true it was, it's true or, or not, that he tried to buy the Phillies in 1943, who were, uh, you know, a de terrible team for a lot, of, a lot of years, and stock them with Negro League players. And he, right. he, he oh. told Landis, and Landis, you know, got them sold to the Carpenter family. Yeah, to those of you listening who think that Negro League is a slur, it wasn't. That's what the leagues were called in those days. Well, yeah, they would have brought in uh, Leonard and Gibson and, uh, you know, Page, who we wound up bringing into Cleveland in 1948. And uh, they were the prim primary force for integration in the American League. That wouldn't, be the city, that wouldn't be the city, Philadelphia, that I would think would have taken to integration all that quickly. No. Well, if they brought in the team and they, they started winning a lot of games, uh, because the, the yeah. Phillies in, the, in 38 to 42, uh, I think was something like 200, combined with 250 games under 500. They were they were they were brutal, and uh, the owner any time a guy named uh, the heck was his name the operator whose name escapes me right now uh, uh, any time a player became good there they sold him somewhere sold Bucky Walters to Cincinnati sold Camilli to the Dodgers sold Kirby Higby to the Dodgers. there's a whole bunch of them that uh, you know when, anytime they showed any promise he'd get rid of them Jerry Nugent was the name of the guy. Uh, just to, you know, be able to continue operations. Okay. And there was no, you know, no TV money or any uh, or anything like that coming in. And so uh, maybe the fans would have been uh, quicker to accept yeah. after all those losing seasons. And yeah. Uh, so anyway, Perini and who owned uh, Louis Perini, who owned the Braves, decided he couldn't operate in Boston anymore. And he was a native there. It was, you know, he, it took him a while to come to, come to grips with this. So since they yeah, controlled the Milwaukee uh, AAA team, uh, uh, two, two weeks before the season started, two or three weeks before the season started, they moved to Milwaukee. In fact, it was so late that the number of the 1953 Braves cards between Tops and Bowman all came out with uh, Boston Braves cards. With the right. B on the, on the cap, and then uh, tops, uh, uh, which came out later than uh, Bowman, airbrushed M's on the 
what number of those cards. You can tell they were airbrushed. It's not doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that. Right. And the Bowman card of Joe Adcock, who they would gotten in uh, March of 1953 from uh, Cincinnati, a four-way deal, uh, has a B on it. He never played an inning for the Boston Braves. Oh. But he was wearing the captain's spring training for a couple of weeks after they, the, the, you know, after they made the move. Right. They made the move when they were already in spring training. Yeah, and the schedules were set, so uh, what they did, since Milwaukee was in the western half, and they, they, they did that by half, even though there were no divisions, as far as scheduling was concerned. And uh, Pittsburgh was in the western half, believe it or not. They shifted Pittsburgh to the east, and Milwaukee, Milwaukee and Pittsburgh essentially traded schedules. You know what I just thought of? The Seattle Marin the Seattle Pilots yeah. become the Milwaukee Brewers. Yeah, because Milwaukee they, they were bankrupt. The same way. Yeah, they they, no, they were training. totally bankrupt. And Milwaukee was the only place that had an open stadium at the time. Ah. So okay. they moved right no. yeah, you're right. They moved right before seventy into into Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah, so they they they, they got approval from the National League. Because uh, the National League approved Perini's move right away, and of course this blocked Vec from going to Milwaukee permanently. And right. the the people of Milwaukee in 1953 welcomed them like conquering heroes. The players, there was nothing that they wouldn't do for them. And they packed the place. They drew, uh, uh, which was tremendous for the time, a million eight for the '53 season. And the team went uh, from a lackluster uh, seventh place finish the last year in Boston to a second place finish in uh, 1953 because there were a whole bunch of games behind the Dodgers because the Dodgers won 105 games that year. But there was nothing they that they, you know, they had spawn and Matthews uh, was playing his second year and Crandall came out of the army. They got an Adcock. They brought up Billy Bruton. Uh, Logan was trying. Logan was in. His second year, and they well, got Andy they Pafko. Dittmar at second base. Said Dittmar, Jack Dittmar. They got Jack Andy Dittmar. Pafko from the Dodgers because the Dodgers unloaded him when they wanted to bring Gilliam up and they had to put Robinson in left field. Oh. So they, they sold Pafko to the Braves for fifty thousand dollars, and he was from and the, he that area. The tune was West Covington, I remember. No, well, that, that was later on. Oh, okay. And they had Sid Gordon yeah. playing left field. Uh, for the first year, and uh, yeah, they came in a pretty good second. Yeah. So the next year, that, that over the winter, they had traded uh, Johnny Antonelli and Don Little and a couple of other players to the uh, uh, Giants for Bobby Thompson. Who was Bobby on Thompson? The slope. Yeah, but, but Bobby Thompson had a pretty good year in 1953. He broke his ankle in spring training. Severely, and they brought in this kid, twenty-year-old kid who had torn up the uh, South Atlantic League, which was a Class A at the time, which they had B, C, and D uh, back then. Twenty-year-old kid from Mobile, Alabama, who absolutely tore up uh, the, the, the South Atlantic League. Okay, and they brought him up as an infielder, and he started hitting in spring training. And Johnny Logan told the story you know, when we had the. Save the National in Milwaukee in 2001. Charlie Grimm, who had you know become the manager at that point, said, "Ask Logan what do you think of him." He said, "This kid's a Hall of Famer, but get him out of the infield before he gets killed." So they put him on left field. Yeah, <coughs> His name I, is Henry Aaron. I remember seeing pictures of him yeah. during number five. Number five. Field. Yeah, he won number five until the. Uh, uh, the first couple of years and took until he took forty four. Yeah. So it took uh, Aaron uh, a year to get adjusted. I mean, his rookie year, most rookies would salivate what, what he had for a rookie year, but uh, you know, by his standards, it was not good. But uh, that that all changed in nineteen fifty five. In nineteen fifty four, they finished uh, second again to the uh, to the Giants. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, they were third. They were behind the Dodgers. 
And uh, the next two years, as they built in, they brought in Lou Burdett, came in from the Yankees. They used him as a relief pitcher for a year or two before. They put him in the starting rotation. Bob Buell had come up. They had traded uh, uh, Gordon and uh, uh, for, and a, a bunch of others for uh, to the Pirates for a second baseman named Danny O'Connell, who had two good years with the Pirates. Next giant. Yeah, well, he, no, he, he giant. became a giant later on. Yeah, future giant. But uh, they, uh, O'Connell uh, got worse every year he was in Milwaukee. But they and uh, they put Pafco on left field and uh, you know and they had a pretty good pitching staff and a pretty good uh, you know a very good hitting team. In 1956, they replaced midway through the season they replaced Charlie Grimm with uh, uh, Fred Haney, who had just come off uh, managing the Pirates to uh, 300 game losing seasons from 1953 to 1955. And uh, they, uh, in 1956, they lost out on the last weekend by one game. The critical game, they were in uh, St. Louis for a three-game series at the end of the season while uh, uh, the Dodgers were uh, hosting the Pirates. And uh, there was a Friday night game where... uh, Cardinal pitcher named Herm Weimeyer, who generally was not very good, beat Spine in 12 innings, two to the one. That put them one game behind the Dodgers, and both both them and the Dodgers went Saturday and Sunday. The highlight of the year was uh, Henry Aaron as a 22-year-old winning the batting title, and Bob Buell. Now, this what what he did that year. Uh, the way things are now, uh, it will never be matched. He beat the Dodgers eight times in that oh. season. In one season? One season. Beat them eight times. Those days they played 22 games with each team. But still, even even that, eight is one hell of a lot yeah. of wins in one season. And the Dodgers were no slouches. Uh, no, the Dodgers won the pennant. They beat them out by one game that year. Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't pitch Spine at Ebbets Field. That was that's the one chink in Warren Spine's, you know, magnificent career is he couldn't pitch well. He couldn't pitch in Ebbets Field. And it got to the point where uh, I don't know if he became mental uh, at some point, but uh, that's they they so they you know, start Buell any time they played in uh, Ebbets Field, he'd get one of the starts. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is they had the All-Star Game in 1955 at County Stadium in Milwaukee. And uh, the uh, National League beat the American League 4-3 to on a 12th inning home run by Sam Musial for a Red Sox pitcher, Frank Sullivan. One of the more exciting All-Star Games of that uh, particular period. So, 57... I Frank Sullivan very well. Yeah, tall, very tall pitcher. Very tall pitcher, and I think he posed, if I'm not mistaken, in a, in a, a painting. Uh, in a, uh, what, what, who was the the Look magazine? Or R- Rockwell, Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell. I think he yeah. wrote. A, a, am I right about that? Did he have a painting uh, that Frank Sullivan possibly was in? possibly. So one, one, one of the things about Frank Sullivan is that uh, uh, he was the, Phil, the Phillies traded him to the Red Sox uh, for Gene Conley at one point. The Gene Conley, you know, obviously came up with the Braves and uh, you know, pitched decently for a couple of years. But the Braves were really willing to get rid of him, so they sent him to the Phillies. And uh, there was six six being traded for six eight. <laughs> that their heights is the tallest trade in the baseball history. <laughs> That's that's yeah. some trivia. Did that win you some trivia contest? Just that question at, at Saber? No, they didn't ask that. They they, they asked you know I, I, who was the winning uh, pitcher in 1955 All Star game because Frank Sullivan was not that great. Okay. Yeah, 
For those of you who don't know Alan Blumpkin, he is a superstar at Saber, which is an organization that uh, you tell us about it, Alan. Tell us it's an it. organization called Society for, Base, for American Baseball Research. They have researchers. They have uh, uh, people who just know certain things, and they had trivia contests. And I was fortunate enough in uh, the 12 years I played from uh, 1987 through 1999 to win the uh, five team championships and two individuals. And uh, they uh, those days you couldn't play in both. Now they allow people to play in both. But, uh, you know, I have my teammates? moments. and uh, Let's play homage to your teammates for a second. Who would they? Well, for, for uh, Tom Sacco, I think you you know. I do. He's Yeah, and uh, uh, the late Dick Thompson, who uh, the three of us were uh, uh, teammates from the, basically from the start, and we had various sports. If I'm not mistaken, Tom Zacco has the largest baseball. Oh, he, what he has is unbelievable. Uh, what you have is unbelievable. No, not anymore. What he has is unbelievable. I, I have sell off part of the stuff I have a few years ago, and I probably got to sell the rest of it off, which I'm right now I'm resisting. But uh, no, Tom, Tom has stuff that's he has file cabinets full of media guides and yearbooks and uh, uh, every paper that came out on baseball. Uh, he has every baseball digest from 1942. Uh, he has all these papers, uh, a, lot, a number of which didn't last very long. He has uh, he has all this stuff. And, My problem uh, if he ever moved out of Connecticut, he would have uh, it cost him uh, fifty thousand dollars just to get the stuff moved. Just to ship it. Yeah. Has he talked to the Hall of Fame at all about any of this stuff? No, he's not ready at this point. Okay. But uh, no, uh, one no, of the things no. is that uh, I think I mentioned it on. Uh, one of the programs we did with Hal Bach, that uh, because of the advent of the Internet and all the information generally is available on the Internet, uh, printed uh, baseball guides and yearbooks and uh, uh, your registers and who's who's and all that, uh, their value has decreased quite a bit. Because everybody's trying, to get, everybody's trying to get rid of it, and the younger generation has no interest in any of this stuff. And it's too bad, and it's too bad that the the price of who's who doesn't stay up because it, 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 they, they, they stopped that. printing that after 2016. I know you can't yeah. find major and minor league records of these guys. No, because the Baseball Digest basically uh, – uh, no, that, no, you can because Baseball America put out something called the Super Register with every major league and minor league player in it. The problem with that, it costs $82. Oh, okay. Zacco has them all. I, 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 I will, that is absolutely I, worth it. Yeah, I, but I, 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 you know, I'll look on the Internet on BaseballReference.com before I'll spend that, that kind, of, kind of money on a uh, something that should sell for $10. Absolutely, and probably will if, if it's on um, eBay long enough and... Um, yeah, you you can yeah, find basic deals, but baseball, I didn't know all, the all the spoiling new stuff, all the spoiling new stuff you can find tons of them on eBay, and most of the prices are, re are reasonable. Uh, but uh, every one of my friends uh, who has a lot of stuff uh, asked me about that, and I said, Steve, see, this is Steve Nadell. You know, he, I told him, Steve, if you go on eBay, you'll find a hundred people trying to get rid of this stuff. Right. Uh, Steve is uh, new to our network. And yes, I know that. He's, a very, he's been a very close friend of mine of you. for 34 what years. What story you guys share? Yeah. Tell us about that, Alan. He, when I, I went to the uh, 1984 Sabre Regional at uh, Shea Stadium, uh, I got a list of the people attending. I see, I'm looking at the address, and I said, Steve Nadell. And he was living in the building where I spent my first eight years in before we moved to Queens in 1951. So I introduced well, I myself to him. a story with the Chapmans in Queens. Um, they lived in the same apartment as I lived in 
in the building that I live back there. Wow. People I got so, acquainted with, became acquainted with on the Internet. It's unbelievable. So, well, well, we kept in touch after that. And when I interviewed Dick Grote in February 1985, <clears throat> I had uh, two, uh, you know, I had an unedited tape of the interview. And uh, he, was a, he was an audio engineer. He's working nights at the uh, WOR at that point. Right. And uh, so he, I, I started discussing him. He, he, helped, he cut the tape for me because I could only play segments of it uh, when I did the presentation on this out in Oakland, at uh, the Sabre Convention uh, in Oakland in 1985. And he cut the tape. I didn't realize you were out here in the, um, 1985, yeah. Yeah, but is there another one planned out here? We were no, they had one in San Francisco in 1998. The one okay. this coming year is in San Diego. Ah. Uh, but okay. uh, you know, I can't fly. I do that kind of flying. Yeah. Well, um, interesting. Let's go back to the, the Braves. Okay, so thing. anyway, back to, to, back to the Braves. Uh, 1957. The, that's where I, yeah. With, yeah, in 1957, everything series. came into place, and they made a trade on the training at the training deadline with the Giants, where the Giants said Red Shane, sent Red Shaney, who was only there for a year, because they had gotten him from the Cardinals in 1956, went to the Braves from the Giants, and the Giants got uh, Bobby Thompson, uh, Danny O'Connell, the second baseman, and a pitcher named Ray Crone. And Shane East had a tremendous year. He got 200 hits that year, stabilized the whole situation at second base. And they won the uh, pennant uh, uh, fairly easily over the uh, Cardinals that year. Now, the let's Yankees, go over what a deep lineup that was. Yeah, they, 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 Crandall was the catcher. Adcock uh, was the first baseman, even though they used Frank Torrey to play defense. Shane East at second, Johnny Wogan at third. Uh, Matthews at third. Matthews, uh, short, I'm sorry, Matthews at third. The outfield consisted of uh, West Covington and uh, Andy Pafko. Pafko and Pafko compl- uh, alternating and left. Yeah, you know, playing. And Billy Bruton. Billy, in now, what happened was Billy Bruton tore his knee up in July. Okay. okay, and there's no, you know, in those days there was no, you know, there were no procedures like they have now with ACLs and the, you know, yeah, the, all, all the surgery. It might yeah, so very- it would take him a year to get back to playing. They moved Henry Aaron from right to center, and they brought up an outfielder by the name of Bob Hazel. Right. Who, Hurricane had, Hazel. Whose nickname Hurricane Hazel. He had two months playing regularly for the Braves. He was a clutch hitter. He batted 403 for the two months. Now, this guy was a total flash in the pan. Yeah, absolutely pulled the year yeah. out. No and they won the pennant fairly easily with that lineup. The pitchers were uh, uh, Warren Spahn, Lou Burdett, Bob Buell. Uh, Rush? Well, Rush wasn't there until 58. Oh, uh, okay. Because they were they were on four days, three three days rest at that point, uh, and the reliever who came late in the year who gave a big pickup to the bullpen was uh, Don McMahon, right? Who eventually would pitch forever in the, in the majors as a reliever, uh, and they won it fairly easily. Then they get <clears throat> to play the perennials in the World Series, the Yankees. <clears throat> and the Yankees, even though they won the pennant in the American League easily, <clears throat> it was not that one of uh, Stengel's better teams. And uh, the series opened at the Yankee Stadium. The Yankees won the first game behind Whitey Ford over Spawn. The Braves won the second game. The y- Yankees, they went back to Milwaukee. And, of course, the whole city of Milwaukee, uh, in fact, the whole state of Wisconsin was going absolutely crazy over this. You know, and Casey Stengel, one of his uh, poorly 
more poorly thought out remarks describe Milwaukee as Bushville. Right, it was poorly no, the, the, thought the, the, out the, the, of his rookie shortstop, Tony Kubek. Kubek was from was there. From Milwaukee. Yeah. He described the Milwaukee as Bushville. Uh, and uh, the Milwaukeeans, not so much the players, but the Milwaukee and, Milwaukeeans took this very, very seriously. It took it as an insult. So seriously, we moved, uh, moved to Milwaukee, and the Bra- Yankees beat the Braves in game three, 12-3. Wow. Uh, Kubek, Tony Kubek uh, hit two home runs in that game. So I get to game four, which was the pivotal game of the series. Uh, the Braves started Warren Spahn. The Yankees started Tom Sturdivant. Uh, the Braves had a 4-1 lead going into the top of the ninth when Spahn gave up a three-run home run to Elston Howard to tie the game. Each team scored in the tenth. To 5-5. The uh, Yankees the, the Yankees, uh, no, I'm sorry, the Yankees scored, to make, it was 4-4 at the end of nine. The Yankees scored in the top of the 10th. I mean, the details are just a little bit hazy after 60 years. Scored a run in the 10th to go ahead 5-4. And they brought in uh, Bob Grimm to pitch the 10th inning. Uh, the Braves got uh, one, man, uh, one man on base. And then they brought, they sent up a pinch hitter named Nippy Jones. Oh, wow. He's been the regular first baseman for a couple of years uh, with the Cardinals in the 48 and 49. Usually was playing the outfield back then. And uh, they, they, they picked up from a minor league scrap heap because this guy hadn't played in the major leagues since a handful of appearances for the 1952 Phillies. Right. And it was an instance he fouled the ball off his foot? Yeah. No, he, he claimed that a pitch hit him in the foot. And oh. the pitch was called the ball. So it led to a dispute. This, uh, you know, and they, they, they kept the ball. And they showed a patch of shoe polish on the ball. Ah. It's almost yeah, like the Cleon Jones situation in the uh, 1969 World Series with the Mets. And they awarded Jones first base. That put runners on first and second. The next batter was Eddie Matthews, and he proceeded to hit a a three-run home run, which won that game. Uh, That was only the the third walk-off game uh, home run in the history of the World Series, first being by Tommy Henrik for the Yankees in 1949, second being Dusty Rhodes for the Giants in 1954. The next day, now at this point, uh, I had the Asian flu and I couldn't even get out of bed, so I listened to the uh, game on the radio. Uh, Lou Burdett beat Whitey Ford one nothing in Game Five, Remember. and that put the Braves up three to two. They came back to Yankee Stadium uh, and beat the uh, beat the uh, Braves in Game Six. That brought it to Game 7. The Yankees started Don Lawson against Lou Burdett. Who comes back on like two, three days. Two days days rest, yeah. Yeah. And they beat the, the Braves beat the Yankees five to nothing. They got four runs in the uh, third inning when uh, uh, Kubek botched the double play ball. And Burdett uh, gave up two or three hits. That was the second shutout. He pitched game two. So in the three games, he pitched three complete games and gave up two runs in the game two and uh, had 24 consecutive scoreless innings. It was one of the all-time great World Series performance. And uh, they won that series, and the play, Milwaukee erupted that night. Now it parades and everything. Ironically, the next... The next year, um, it was just the reverse. Yeah, the next year, they would win the pennant again, but certain things, uh, a couple of little things went wrong. 
uh, more than a little things. Bob Buell came up with a sore arm and could hardly pitch during the season. Uh, they had gotten Bob Rush, who had pitched uh, very well for uh, 10 years of very bad Cub teams, to fill the void. And Rush would go on to now, win 10 games. Now, you mentioned Topps airbrushing the cards. They got him with Casey Wise. And if you look at their 58 cards, yeah. they were airbrushed, their Cub uniforms airbrushed into Brave uniforms. No, they did a lot in that 57 set. 58 so they I, did a lot of that back I then. know and someone like me who has that and very little else in their brain all these years um, has to be <laughs> noted um, how I remember stuff like that and can't remember where my keys are um, yeah one of the worst air brushings was the 57 Bobby Chance who had oh, just been traded to the Yankees and you can see the NY on the uniform patched over the A. Right, right. I remember Bobby Chance as a Yankee. I remember him pitching to his brother Wilbur. Wilmer, yeah. Well, yeah, well, in one book I have, uh, you know, Wilmer, Wilmer was tall. Wilmer, now. Was, Wilbur. Bo- Bobby Wilbur. wasn't as tall as Wilmer, but he was much better. So, uh, uh, anyway. The other thing that developed that year was Red Shaney's came down with tuberculosis. Yes. He played the, 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 that season, but uh, his production was not nearly what it was the year before. They won and the pennant Felix fairly Mantia, easily. The, Felix Mantia filled in for him. Well, well, I'll get to that in 1959. Uh, and in 58, they finished... Uh, Eight games ahead of the second place Pirates, who were having their best year in ten years, by far. Then the Yankees who had a very easy trip in the American League that year. Uh, there was a point in the first day or two of August, 1958, and you can look this up, where the Yankees were the only team in the American League over 500. Whoa! Like August 1st or August Whoa. 2nd, yeah. And yeah, they fell off uh, the last six weeks, and they and they had a uh, yeah, you know, they they were not playing well going into the series. So the series opened in Milwaukee, and the Braves won the first two. They won uh, fairly easily. They won four to three the first game, and the second game, they, Bardet hit a home run in the uh, second game, and they won that game thirteen to five. They come back to Yankee Stadium for Game Three. They started Larson against Bob Rush. The Yankees won the game 4 nothing. Larson didn't pitch a complete game, but he pitched well enough. Now, Hank Bauer, who was one of the great clutch players of that era, in that game got three of the four Yankee hits and knocked in all four of the Yankee runs. Wow. That was How the many Hall of Famers played in that game? Yeah. How many future Hall of Famers played in Not that game? Not a lot. Like you had the three on the bra- four on the Braves, who changed each to spawn, Aaron and Matthews. The Yankees had Barra Mantle uh, in that series, Ford, and uh, I think you know Slaughter was still there. Right. You don't think of him as a Hall of Famer. I know. One doesn't. One doesn't think of him as a Hall of Famer. He had some pretty good years with the Yankees. Yeah, well, he, he made his, most of his points with the Cardinals. I may have mentioned this before. He's perceived as being a racist. But I have a picture. That he I denies that in the, his, his autobiography, which I have. And, you know, by a, a picture that I have of him, Suitcase Simpson, and two or three other Yankees just standing around, Slaughter's got his arm around Simpson, and they've got this look of friendship on their face. Well, some of this, uh, a lot of this evolved because certain players who uh, were very opposed to playing with blacks, after they played a year or two with them, uh, they accepted it. Right. Not only accepted it, just yeah. befriended them and realized their idiotic, idiotic uh, 
uh, thought process that goes into their upbringing or whatever ever it was that, that uh, I can think of guys that made radical changes in their lives. Bobby Bragan, for instance. Yeah, well, the, the, after, uh, after one game in the 1948 World Series, there's a picture of a picture of Indian pitcher Steve Bromack hugging Larry Dolby. That went viral, and uh, you know back then uh, with newspapers, and uh, that got a lot of unfavorable reaction uh, by the uh, racists at that point. In fact, yeah, the Bromack said in an interview that he uh, got a lot of flack. Uh, he was from Hamtramck, Michigan. Uh, which is uh, uh, almost an entirely Polish town. He got a lot of flack from, uh, uh, you know, his uh, neighbors for that picture. Right. And there's a story also that uh, Clint Courtney, the catcher on the Browns, who was originally from Alabama, who came up with, uh, you know, the, the sudden attitude at that time about plaques, and he became very close friends with Satchel Page. And he said, if anybody gives me trouble down, you know, after the season down home, he says, me and Satchel will take care of all of them. Uh, yeah. A story like that is nice to hear. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, the, uh, so the Yankees took the series from them. And, uh, what, the big story on the off season for them was, Changing tuber tuberculosis. They had to have part of a lung cut out, and we'd miss, except for a few token appearances uh, late in the season, he'd miss the entire season of, uh, uh, of 1959. And uh, they used seven second basemen to try to replace him. I refer to them as the Magnificent Seven. They were all horrible. The only one who had any major league credentials, real major league credentials at the time, was Bobby Avila, who had been the second baseman for the Indians, who won a bank title in 1954. But he was essentially done by the time he got there. They had Casey Wise and Felix Mantilla and Johnny O'Brien from the O'Brien Twins and Joe Morgan, the one who became the manager of the Red Sox, not the not the Hall of Famer. Right. Uh, and Chuck Cottier, who was another one who couldn't hit. And Casey Wise was uh, probably the rest of A guy named Mel Roach who was a bonus baby. He tore his knee up. Uh, and uh, Casey Wise couldn't hit at all. Uh, so they were a week there. And for some reason, uh, Fred Haney decided to platoon uh, Frank Torrey almost on a full-time basis with Joe Adcock who was a much superior hitter. And they wound up yeah. being taught, and uh, they wound up being tying the Dodgers for first place in the National League that year. Uh, Burdett and Spahn threw their arms off. Both had over 300 innings. And both wound up with 21 and 15 records. You they know, had Joey J and Juan Pizarro. Was Juan Pizarro. was Juan Pizarro. Yeah. And Joey J. You couldn't see a back of a, a Joey J baseball card without it saying that he was the, the first graduate of the Little League to play in the Major Leagues. Exactly. And but Pizarro uh, so, uh, was a star, and I think he got a hard time playing in Milwaukee. And, he wasn't a star yeah. there. He, he developed when he went to the White Sox. He, I, I know, but I, he, yeah. he was Latin and... Um, yeah. He had a hard time. He had a hard time in Milwaukee and kind of forced the issue out of there. If yeah. I, I remember. Well, they, they 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 traded him after 1960. Uh, they traded him and uh, uh, Joey J to the Reds for Roy McMillan, who was very solid. Very solid fielder, not not a great hitter, but no. McMillan was starting to uh, uh, put on a couple of years, and he was. Uh, being replaced in Cincinnati by uh, Leo Cardenas. So anyway, and then uh, Cleveland goes over to the Mets and helps Buddy Buddy Harrelson yeah. develop. And um, it's amazing how baseball. So in 1959, they played the Dodgers two playoff games. First one was in Milwaukee; they lost. It was a two out of three series, like they had in 1951 and 1946 
they would have again in 1962. They go out to uh, the L.A. Coliseum. Now, they player for player, they were much better than the Dodgers. The Dodgers at that point were a mishmash of uh, uh, you know young players and Brook- former Brooklyn Dodger veterans like uh, Hodges and Siren Ferrillo was still on that team. And the second game, I remember vividly watching this on TV because I was rooting against the Dodgers because I always did in those days. The Braves took a three-run lead going to the bottom of the ninth. Dodgers got three runs to tie it up. And the game went uh, 12 innings, and the Dodgers scored a run in the bottom of the 12th, and they won a pennant. And they went on to defeat the White Sox in the World Series. Uh, this is it. This is in 1959. Right. And one of the offshoots that came out of that was those numbers are counted in the regular season from those those games. So it gave Eddie Matthews a home run in one of the games, the home run title over Arnie Banks. And that year, Henry Aaron hit 355, won the second batting title, and became the first player since 19... 19- uh, Sam Musial in 1948 to get 400 total bases. And he lost out on an MVP to Ernie Banks, uh, which I uh, thought was a very raw deal. It is a raw deal because the Cubs were terrible. Yeah. And he, w- he won it like three times, if I'm not mistaken. Twice in a row, Banks. 58 and 59. Twice. Henry Aaron's only MVP was in 1957. Okay. But... Uh, that was almost like a uh, turning point. They started, they got rid of Haney. They brought in succession of succession of managers who I think were not very, very good. The three you managers who managed... After Haney or before? After Haney. Three managers that they had after Haney were Charlie Dressen, Bertie Tebbets, and Bobby Bragan. Okay, all old school. Okay, and uh, what happened was also was the a lot of the uh, regulars like Logan and Adcock and uh, Crandall and, uh, started getting old. They shipped Billy Bruton to the Tigers after 1960 for uh, se- second baseman Frank Bowling, who was a, had been a regular in Detroit for. Uh, Seven seasons, and he was a good player, but nothing, not, not on the level of Red Shanes. Hey, he's Milt's brother. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and as in 1961, you something Frank is remembered for being Milt's brother. Yeah. And Milt is remembered for being Frank's brother. Yeah, when well, the Bowman, the Bowman set in 1955, the TV set, uh, their error cards where, where they have. Uh, Frank, the back, back, the back, which should have been on Frank's on Milt's, and vice versa. Oh, they, wow. erect, they, issue, they reissued them correctly, so the the, the error ones are uh, worth some money. Especially to Mrs. Bow. Bo- yeah. Um, and uh, so, the, the, and Pafco had retired after 1959, so the team started to get a lot younger, and the only three. Uh, you know, perennials, uh, they have four exactly, but Bur- Bur- Burdett was still there. He'd go to the Cubs in a couple of years, uh, or Spawn Aaron and Matthews. Yeah, they, they finished, started to bring some sluggers in. Yeah, they brought in, uh, Frank Thomas Bloody. from the, uh, the, uh, Cubs at that point. They brought up kids right. like Mac Jones, who would hit 20 home runs in the season. They brought up, uh, they got Felipe Alou. A couple of years later, in a trade with the Giants, uh, right, Giants were given in the outfielders all over the. Yeah, league. I know. Yeah, and they had hitters, but they slipped to second place behind the Pirates in 1960. Uh, they finished uh, second in 1961 to the Reds, and in the last four years in Milwaukee, they finished fifth or sixth. They had three fifth place finishes and one sixth place finishes. <laughs> this was Still after the expansion in 1962, and they still finished with uh, wins, uh, 87 to 88 wins. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're most famous for foisting Felix Mantia to the New York Mets. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so uh, they and they started the the farm system started to dry up a little bit, uh, and they they signed two bonus babies who both wound up on the Mets. They paid a lot of money to Hawk Taylor and John Demerit. Both wound up on the early Met teams, and yes, uh, both didn't pan out very well. Yeah, and one of the critical things that happened in 1961, the, the Senators moved to Minnesota, and what that did was cut the Braves TV market down quite a bit, because the Braves had Minnesota, they had the Dakotas. They were basically a regional franchise. And when Minnesota came in, it severely cut down their TV revenue. And uh, they were looking for a way out. Yeah, and Perini sold uh, the team to a group headed by a man named Bill Bartholomew. And it became fairly obvious as they went in the 60s they wanted to move the team. The team started to draw less because they weren't as competitive. I don't know how much the uh, uh, revival of the Green Bay Packers, uh, uh, you know, the effect of that uh, came on uh, uh, the people in Milwaukee, but they started to draw less and less every year. So in 1964, they announced that the after that season, they announced that they were going to move to Milwaukee, uh, preferably to after Atlanta. that season. To Atlanta. That the lease at the county stadium went through 1965. Oh, okay, from Milwaukee, when they moved from Okay, Atlanta. Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee took the Braves to court and made them satisfy the lease for the last year. 1965. Okay. They drew under half a million. Oh, lame duck. Yes, yeah, Spawn was gone. Spawn uh, had his last great year in 1963 when he was 23 and 7. He had, he had a bad year, a very big year in 1964. And then went to the. And then, and then went to the. Uh, uh, Mets in 1965 for uh, a few months and then finished up with the Giants his major league career. Uh, Aaron still had 10 years to go and Matthews was also uh, running down at the time. He, uh, his playing time was less and less. They traded him to Houston after 1966 and he wound up collecting a World Series share with the 1968 Detroit Tigers. I mean, they had, they had a couple of pitchers who started to do well. They had a pitcher named Tony Kleininger who won 24 games for them uh, one year and hit two Grand Slam home runs in a game. Uh, and they had the uh, Phil Nico was starting to develop. But the what they had in the farm teams and what was coming coming up were not basically not in the class of the players they had in the early part of the uh, tenure. And uh, it, it was a very bit of divorce. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So what happened uh, when uh, the second expansion in 1969 – came about uh, because of the fact that Milwaukee had held uh, the Braves for the last year of their lease in 1965. The National League awarded uh, their two expansion franchises to Montreal and San Diego. And Milwaukee at the point uh, in 68 and 69 uh, hosted uh, would host uh, uh, a number of White Sox games in, in County Stadium during those two seasons because the White Sox we're not drawing uh, anybody in those, those uh, in those years. And finally, as we, we talked about before, when the Seattle Pilots, who were one of the two expansion teams in the American League in 1969, went bankrupt right before they started the regular season, Milwaukee was the only place that had a major league stadium available. So the okay. Seattle Pilots moved them, moved them to Milwaukee. They changed their name to the minor league what the minor league team was known forever as the Milwaukee Brewers. It took right. Milwaukee fans uh, 
a while to accept the Brewers as a replacement. And the Brewers have, uh, you know, done fairly decently since, uh, you know, they, re- they came to Milwaukee. But the Braves, and ironically, Bud Selig makes them a National League team again. Yeah. Well, Bud Selig was the, one of the leading forces into getting a team back to Milwaukee. Right. And he owned the Brewers for until he became commissioner and had to divest himself of them. And, and uh, but uh, the Bra- the whole year of the Braves, uh, the tw- 13 years of the Braves were uh, uh, like anything else, an ascent, a peak, and then a downfall. Right. But the th- enthusiasm for Milwaukeeans for the team uh, when they became uh, relatively mediocre in the 60s was not nearly the same as it was when they came there. Alan. There's enough blame to go around on all sides. So I'm leaving, but again, uh, the uh, the uh, syndicate that bought the bought the Braves from uh, Louis Perigny bought them, especially after the advent of the Minnesota Twins, bought them with the idea of moving them out. Gotcha. And Atlanta was virgin territory because there was nothing in the that part of the country to uh, challenge them. And you can't say enough about the success they've had in Atlanta, both TV money yeah, um, and, like, what, 10 in a row? Um, yeah, thir- 13 and 14, but they only, they only wound up winning one World Series. It was like the, the old Dodgers in Brooklyn. They won every year, but uh, they only wound up winning one World Series. Dan Schlossberg has written a book about them uh, that uh, – Atlanta Braves dynasty, which is very good. And uh, I was a guest on one of our know, shows yeah. on the network a week or so ago. And, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, the the Atlanta Braves. Uh, uh, you know, after a, a stretch uh, during the seventies, and uh, you know, up until the advent of the uh, uh, Stripper Jones and uh, the Maddox Smoltz. Uh, Lavin the pitching were uh, uh, really not very successful. They only had won one division uh, in 1982 when they had uh, Dale Murphy and uh, uh, Joe Torrey was managing them. They wanted they wanted division, and then the Cardinals wiped them out in the LCS. Yeah, that Burroughs was a power hitting outfielder back then. Yeah. Around the time Murphy was. And the there. highlight of their entire stretch then was uh, when Harry Aaron hit the, the 715th home run. Right, as a DH. I might no, it was a Mar- National League. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, you know, if, uh, Al Downing, who you had on the show. Comes back to the NL and. Uh, yeah, you know, after, after 1974. The American League. Yeah, after 1974, they traded him to the Brewers where he spent his last two years. But when they traded him, he was 40. Right. right. Alan, good show, good recap of uh, the most successful franchise in baseball, if you want to look at it from a regular season standpoint. Yeah, I also want to mention that there's a very active uh, Facebook site called the Milwaukee Braves Historical Association. It's headed by... Uh, guy who's a good friend of mine named Rick Schabowski, and uh, it, it's very, very active. In fact, we've had, uh, uh, we've had uh, Greg Spahn, Warren Spahn's son, is a member of it, and so are two of uh, Del Crandall's sons. Oh, wow. So it's very, very, uh, very, very interesting when these, uh, these people, uh, you know, post something. Oh, I'll look for that site, Milwaukee Braves. Braves Historical Association. Beautiful. Yeah, I've been a member Thank almost. Thank you, Alan. A... Yeah. I'm not cutting you off, but we're about to. I know, to... we're running a little bit late. Okay. We're running a little bit late. Thank you very thank much, you. Ralph. I'm glad that I had the opportunity to uh, share this knowledge. No, the pleasure is mine, and the pleasure is the networks and the audience that listen to Alan. Thank you for your knowledge. Okay, I'll see you Sunday at noon. You're terrific. Sunday morning it'll be. 
Be well, okay. my friend. And thank you for listening, everybody. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm lucky enough to talk to some of the most interesting people on the planet. Alan is right up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. All Take right. care. Be well, everybody. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be back. Adios. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.